My aunt Diana died at an early age. She was 48. She got a melanoma in her eye and it expanded into her brain. She was the most beautiful woman. Glossy blonde hair, blue eyes, a bright smile. Whenever she talked with you, you felt appreciated, heard, loved. She had this way about her, a magical way of just bringing you in. Diana was married to a doctor and they had two sons. And when the boys got to be teenagers, the family loved to go skiing together. Diana told me that they were on one trip and her teenage boys found this ski jump. So you were going down a mountain, but then there was this great chasm and you were supposed to just sort of fly over it and land and keep going. So of course her oldest son, who's at that time 17, does it easily and it's like, yes, yes. And then of course her younger son was like, I gotta do it because my brother did it and he does it. And then the father goes, oh, well, I guess, and he does it. And Diana said, why did I have boys? And they're all on the other side now, cheering for her. Come on, Mom, you can do it, Mom. And she's terrified. But she said, oh, what the heck. And she just skied as fast as she could down and flew over the chasm and made it to the other side. Yes. Last weekend was Halloween. I've been catching up on my horror movies. All Hallows Eve, and today we celebrate All Saints Day. This is the season in which we look into the chasm of death. The days grow darker. I like the falling back part, though, don't you? When it comes to death, though, from the human perspective, all we see is this darkness. When we have horror movies, they're supposed to scare us, right? And so all they're about is death and death and death. I saw the movie Scream. Do you remember that came out in the 1990s? All it is is one person getting stabbed after another, after another. That's the whole movie. As if to die is the worst thing that could ever happen to you. I think that's what we believe. I mean, when we go to war, what do we do with our worst enemy? We try to kill them. All human beings basically see death as the worst possible outcome that could ever happen to any one of us, which is weird because, like I've said before, the death rate is 100%, right? So we're all terrified of this dark unknown. And we use words like doctors will say on the operating table, I lost her, or she's gone. We will say, he passed away. All we see is emptiness. We have a person who's alive and breathing, and then all of a sudden, that person is gone and we have a body, an object left. And for us, it is terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Of course it is. All we see is nothing. So of course we're scared to take the leap. Why wouldn't we be? We don't see anything beyond this life. That is the human perspective on death. And in American culture, we make it even worse. I will do burials, and at the cemetery, they will get out thick grass to put over the grave. Plastic green grass, so that we don't have to look into the hole, because that's too scary. It's acceptable when someone dies, 
to have a, put, a little period of grieving, but then when you go back to work, you're supposed to sort of get on with life. And people are uncomfortable if you bring up the person that you love who's died. Oh, and we all kind of pretend that we're not going to die either, right? Our advertisements tell us if you use enough oil of Olay, you'll last forever. Just keep working out. Oh, vitamin B. We're so scared that we don't even really know how to talk about it. But Jesus had an entirely different perspective. In this gospel for today, Jesus is in the Galilee with his disciples when he hears news that his best friend, Lazarus, is very sick and could die. Now, Jesus didn't have a home, per se, but the closest thing that he had to a home was his friend's house in Bethany, where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. It was there that he really could relax. They were his people. So you would think, hearing that your best friend is dying, that he would be freaked out and rush back, but Jesus isn't at all worried about it. Oh, he's dying? Okay. It's clear from his reaction that Jesus doesn't think much about the fact that Lazarus is dying. In fact, he doesn't even leave. He waits two whole days doing his ministry, and then, he's tra- and then he sets off and walks from the Galilee to the outskirts of Jerusalem to Bethany to his friend's house. And when he gets there, because he didn't feel the need to rush, so what? He's dying. Everybody dies. Why should I be panicked about that? He gets to Bethany and he sees all these people have gathered. First Martha and then her sister Mary rush to him and say, Jesus, if you had only rushed here, if you had only come, maybe our brother wouldn't have died. He sees them crying, tearing their hair, tearing their clothes. And Jesus looks around, and it's the grief that upsets him. It's not the death of his friend. It says he's deeply troubled in spirit, not by Lazarus, but by all the people that are in so much pain. It's as if he, he didn't conceive of it. I remember going into a hospital. I was a chaplain A Jamaican family and their father, grandfather, had died and they were wailing and falling on the ground. It was part of their culture. I thought, wow. So much pain in the room. Jesus sees this grief, this agony, this fear, and it's that that makes him sad and troubled. And so he goes to the tomb And he says, roll away the stone. And Martha, who's the much more practical of the two sisters, says, there's going to be a smell. Yes, he says, go ahead and roll it away anyway. And Jesus calls out Lazarus' name. Lazarus, come out. And the man who is dead walks out of the tomb, wrapped all in the bands of cloth that they buried people in. And Jesus says, unbind him. Let him go. You know, Lazarus would die just one year later. He was killed one year later. So I've always felt kind of sorry for the guy because he dies, goes to heaven, has to come back and get murdered again. So it's obvious that Jesus didn't bring him back for his sake. So why did Jesus do it? 
Why did he bring Lazarus back? When my oldest son, Luke, was a little baby, he was just a few months old. Do you know that adorable age when you can play peekaboo? Because they're so scared when they can't see you, but then as soon as they see you, they're happy again. So you can say, peekaboo, and they're like, wow, you know? When I would leave a room, Luke would cry, and so I'd have to come back in and say, I'm still here. I was in the living room with him, and he was in his bouncy seat, and the mail came through the mail slot in the front hall. We were living in Connecticut at the time. I heard the mail and just went just around the corner into the next room to get the mail, and of course Luke started to cry. So I popped my head back in and said, I'm right here, it's okay. And he said, you know how babies do, beautiful smile. But as I was going back to get the mail, it occurred to me, oh, that's what Jesus was doing with Lazarus. You know, Jesus said that his father has many rooms in the mansion. And I think for Jesus, when we die, it was as natural as walking into another room. So he just had Lazarus pop back and say to us, here he is, it's okay, look. It's okay, he, he's really not gone. He's right here. The thing that distinguishes Christianity more than any other fact is our understanding of death. We look at death not from our perspective of the scary chasm that we may or may not make it to the other side of. We look at death from Jesus' perspective. We believe that the people who have died that we love, they're not really gone. They're just around the corner in the next room. And like Jesus, who called out Lazarus's name, we can call out the names of the people that we love who have died. And every year on this All Saints Sunday, we get you to fill out these little sheets and you write down, and you can get them out right now of your bulletin. I want you to get out this little sheet and write, try to write legibly if you can, the names of the people that you love who have died your saints are the people that when you get to heaven, they have to be there. They're the ones with the welcome home sign. You know who they are. They're your particular people. They don't have to have been perfect. You just have to be bound to them in love. Please take a moment and write their names down. The ushers will come around and collect these little sheets with their baskets and the ancient practice of the church is to read these names aloud as we receive the bread and the wine. It's called the necrology because we believe that in heaven and at this altar, we are surrounded by all the communion of saints. They're with us and we are not afraid to speak their names. So I'll give you a few moments to fill out this little card. There are pencils in your pews. And when you are ready, just hold up your card like this, and the ushers will come and collect the names. <laughs> 